Okay, guys, top of the hour. Uh, good morning again. Uh, test will be returned uh, tomorrow. Okay. Um, maybe the key will be questioned by uh, later this afternoon. Uh, lab today, we'll meet down here at 2.30. We'll have some lecture time uh, on uh, residence. We'll finish up the residence handout. Um, yeah. You have your uh, brumination report. That would be the Monday lab. Brumination report, that's still being lab. Yeah, you can pass that to the center, please. Monday lab, Monday lab. Any other Monday lab? Tuesday lab, your report will be due tomorrow here in class, yeah? Uh, the group lab, um, I think I can make that due on Monday. Um, I think it needs to be due for both groups, Monday, here in class, group lab. Next uh, tomorrow and Thursday, we're doing the Dills Alder lab. Dills Alder. Uh, Dills Alder, that's a type of dying reaction. Hand out today. Everybody gets a pink sheet. Creative, don't be in there. 
And the, both alkenes have to be in the help, in the, in the longest continuous chain. Now here we didn't have a choice. Maybe only one on the end we will. Both double bonds have to be in the longest continuous chain. Heptadiene. What else do we need here? We need, to, we need a couple other things. First off, where are the double bonds located? They could be here and here, and that'd still be a heptadiene. What's the one end, left or right? Right. Right. Correct. That's two, three, four, right? The double bonds are at the two and four positions. Two, four heptadiene. Because you can also have maybe a 2,6 heptadiene. What else do we need in our name? Is this completely clear, non ambiguous, or is it missing something? Somebody said something earlier. E and Z. E and Z. The double bond into 2. What is it? E or Z? E. E. It's, e. it's trans. This is just I substituted. And this one? E. They're both E. So we can put in the front here, E comma E, parentheses to indicate. Now the first E goes with the 2 and the second E goes with the 4. For example, if it was 1 was E and 1 was Z, you need to, but the first letter goes with the first number. Can we do uh, E2 and then that's E4 like that? Like still. You perhaps could. You may see some variations, yeah. but I think this is typical right here. If this says Z E, the Z would be the two, right. and then the E would go with the four. Let's do another. What's the name of the next compound? This one is what? Z, comma, E. Same exact name. That's just a stereoisomer. Differs by projection of or configuration, or how you want to call it, of that end alkene. Methyl is projected on the same side as this other group as opposed to opposite sides. Yep, just scare ice cream. Yep, name the compound on the end there. What's the uh, root name, the longest continuous chain name? Hexadiene. Hexadiene? Yeah, but I see a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 here. Well, you need to include two. Right, that's no good because if we do that, this double bond is not completely included in that. Both carbons need to be in. So it's, it's here. Both carbons of each alkene. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yes. Yeah. Hexadiene. That is a hexadiene. But where are the double bonds at? What's the one position? One. Left or right? Right. It's going to be right. Why? Because either way, it's a one, one, five, right? Yeah, the same. Either way, it's a 1,5 hexadiene. But why do we make this the one? So then we think about substituents, and first the sub will be at 1 and 2 as opposed to uh, 5 and 6. Because that's the same either way. Uh, what do we got? Uh, propyl, what do we got? 1 chloro, 2 propyl. Propyl, 
Many of you on the test, I'm not using the YL ending, you, you name that like 1-chloro-2-propane or something. No, when it's a substituent, it's YL, propyl, butyl, pentyl. What else do we need with this compound? Do we need any E or Z? Are the alkenes stereogenic? Uh, uh huh. How about if I just put E here? Are we done? Why do we need to specify what the E refers to? Could it refer to the other one? No. No, it doesn't, it doesn't refer to the other one. Because the other one is not stereogenic. The E, it, it clearly applies to the stereogenic one. This alkene is not stereogenic. We need nothing there. Six alkenes on the board, all of them are stereogenic except for that one. There's no easy possible. Good name? Yeah? Yeah? Uh, terpenes, terpenoids. Uh, a type of natural product. Previously we saw alkaloids, natural products. Caffeine is an alkaloid. Uh, morphine is an alkaloid. Strychnine, it's lots of alkaloids. What are those? They have a basic nitrogen, so they're alkaline like alkaloid. Another class of natural products are terpenes. Terpenes are not alkaloids. They're, they do not have basic like properties. They do not have the basic nitrogen. Uh, terpenes are natural products made from a simple diene known as isoprene. We can name this. What's the IPAC name of this? 1,3-butadiene. Yeah. 2 methyl 1,3-butadiene. Neither alkene is stereogenic, so you don't need any E or Z for either. Common name for that is isoprene. And isoprene in nature <coughs> serves as a monomer, and it can be polymerized, not a total polymer, but like dimer, trimer, tetramer. <coughs> this becomes a, a repeating unit or a building block to lots of natural products like limonene, which is found where? I don't know if I spelled that right. That's supposed to be an E. I, but it's, it's found in lemons. Go L E. Okay? Everybody, anybody ever squeeze a lemon or in something on your fish or in your iced tea or something? Okay, mm -hmm. you're putting this compound in your, you're digesting it. It's a natural product formed in that fruit. It has formula which is double this. And this is where this has sort of come together and self reacted. Okay? Um, now we may be able to show chemistry or mechanism at some point. There's others. Taxidiene, that's a bigger molecule, right? But it's what? It's this times what? Four times. It's four of these. This is the building block, okay? And these are all called terp, uh, terpenes or terpenoids. Retinol, where do we find retinol? Yes, that's right, in the eye. Okay? Maybe in some skin creams, too, maybe. I don't know. Uh, it's a terpenoid, because it, is, it is it a multiple of that? No. No, it's got an oxygen. So at some point, it was a multiple of that, but then something else occurred in the, in the chemistry to introduce an oxygen. Maybe a hydration reaction occurred on one of the double bonds. So it's no longer considered a terpene, but it's kind of like a terpene. So it's called a terpenoid. Okay. Uh, lots of good-looking molecules up here, yeah? Beta carotene. Anybody ever eat a carrot? Okay. Or other fruit, tomatoes or something. Lycopene, very good for the eyes. 
Well, these are cleaved in the body. Look at this. What if I kind of cut this in half and put an OH group out here? Would it start looking like this? Yeah. You see, this is converted to retinol in the body by a cleavage reaction. And retinol is for the eyes. That's why carrots are good for your eyes. Because these, these other molecules that are involved with eyesight are produced from things that are in carrots and tomatoes and stuff. Okay? Uh, taxol. Structure is not exactly up here, but taxidiene is. You can look up the structure of taxol used to, to, to treat breast cancer. It's a natural product. It's a terpene or terpenoid. It's produced by the yew tree. This is a big tree. This is them chopping it down, if you can see that on your print. Uh, you can look that up. Okay, so that's a class. You ever heard of terpenes in your body classes or anything yet? Okay, good. Uh, chemistry of diene. 1-2 versus 1-4 addition to diene. By the way, that reaction where you cleave the alkene in half, that's, that's an organic two reaction. Sort of similar to maybe like an ozonolysis. You can cleave that molecule and end up with an oxygen there and type. Uh, it's an oxidation type reaction. Uh, okay, if we take, okay, focusing on dienes, two, twice the fun, okay? Two enes in one molecule. By the way, what if it had three enes? Brain. What if you had like 28? At that point, we call it a polyene, just multiples. Okay. Uh, we had HBr, cold temperature. You can get this product over here. Uh, we've added HBr to the formula. It's an addition reaction mechanism. But if you look at it, this double bond over here is just really not doing anything. The chemistry is just right over here. We've done this already the past 10 days. We've got H+. Plus. Uh, where are we going to make cation at? Left or right? On the right, correct. So this swings out like this. Boom, 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 boom. UH here, yeah. Cation here. And what's the next step to get that product? Yeah. <coughs> the bromide attacks the carbon cation. It's just nothing really new there. We'll see what we'll be doing new here. But what can we say about this carbon cation? Can you say anything about it? Stability? Or? Resonance stabilized. Can we do resonance? Yes, when she will wipe her over. Keep the H thrown in. Yeah. Reaction with the H plus. Leads to a resonant stabilized carbocation in this case. What do, you, do we have a name for such carbocation with, uh, where the cation is next to an alkene? Yes, we do. I'll rephrase my question. What is the name of a carbocation that is next to an alkene? It starts with al. Oh, oh. Alilic, right? get an allylic cation, a resin stabilized allylic cation. Okay. Resonance error. When we, by the way, when you add H plus to something, or when something attacks H plus, what is that process called? It starts with a P. It starts with a pro. It starts with a protonation. Protonation? Okay. Yeah. So when we protonate the alkene here, we get an allylic 
cation, which is present, stabilized. This is the lingo of organic chemistry, right? Yeah? Um, all right. What next? Could you draw the hybrid of this? It's a delocalized cation. It's a, it's a hybrid, right? Anytime you do resonance, right? How do you find a product? Br minus attacks where? Which cation? Right here, correct? And what does that give? It's the product, right? There you go. Uh, this is called the kinetic product. It's formed fastest and thus always first. Why? We'll talk about that down below. It'll make more sense. Let's see another, another outcome, a, vari a variation here. If we do this at high temperature, and I want to keep this up here because it's like the same mechanism up to a point. If we do this with higher temperature, see this is cold, minus 78. Why minus 78? Could you do it at minus 72? Or minus 65? Why minus 78? Magical about minus 78? That's the temperature that you get when you put dry ice in acetone. Okay? It becomes minus 78. And thus, many reactions are done at minus 78 because they're done at this. Okay? If dry ice in acetone became minus 74, then it, they'd be done at minus 74. Okay? Why not minus 76? Because there's, there's probably not a solvent that becomes minus 76 when you put it in, in dry ice. So it, just, it just comes from that dry ice acetone temperature. You can get others. Dry ice and acetonitrile, I think it's minus 40. You can find a list of all these. Okay. Uh, water in regular ice is what? <coughs> get different temperatures for mixing wet ice or um, the dry ice is commonly used in the laboratory. Which is what? What is dry ice? Silica. Solid. What is dry ice? Have you guys ever seen or used dry ice or anything? No? No? solid carbon dioxide, CO2, solid form, right? right? It's very cold. Uh, it's interesting physical chemistry there. Uh, it's sublime to go straight from a solid to a gas. Okay. Um, you get lots of, lots of applications. You ever make ice cream and use dry ice? No? Cooking, sometimes when cooking dry ice is used for freezing things real quick or something like that. Okay. Uh, so if we do this with higher temperature, we get a different product. Huh. Same, same everything. How do you think we get the other product? Mechanism is already up here, except when we just do something different at the end. What's the difference? Instead, the halide attacks here. <coughs> I, I, don't, don't let that throw you. It looks like a bond, a carbon bond. No, it's one, two, three, four carbons. One, two, three, four, and now the bromine's added to the end carbon, right? Okay, higher temperature and it ends up attacking there. By the way, in the mechanism leading to that product, how many intermediates were there? Or do either product? How many intermediates are on the board? One. One. How many? One. Good. Why one? Because that's the same thing. Right. 
What is it really attacking? I'll, I'm going to get rid of the H. That's one thing on the board. Two fake structures for one thing. This is what it's attacking. And the BR minus either attacks here. Why would it attack here? Because there's some pause positive here. The BR minus is approaching this and it's like, hmm, positive. It's not a full positive. You don't have a full positive. It's delocalized. BR minus can make a bond here, and the magic of the bond takes place. Physics, minus the triking plus, and a bond will form. That's what we're showing right here. Or it could, it could attack over here. If it attacks here, see, the problem is, how do you do a mechanism with partial bonds? I mean, when you add it here, do you move partial bonds? When it adds here, really, you might could. When it adds here, this partial bond sort of moves over here and localizes over here. So when it adds there, the electrons sort of end up localized over there. But we just don't use, do mechanisms with hybrids. We do mechanisms with our fake structures. Uh, the kinetic product is formed fastest. Why? Right here. When this is formed, so it like that, where's the BR at? When this is formed, where's the BR at? product here? We talked about this last week or so, about 10, 20, uh, 9, 20, or 10, 20. This one's more stable because it's disubstituted. That is monosubstituted, right? See that? More stable. The more stable product is called the thermodynamic product. It's more stable. Okay? But it's not formed fastest or first. Something else we can offer is terminology. This is called a 1 2 product. Because where is the new H at? Here, where is the bromine? Next door, 1 2. Here, where is the new H at? Also on the end, where's the bromine at? One, two, three, four. So it refers to the relationship between the H and where the bromine or the halide or whatever is adding ends up. In this example, the one, two product is the kinetic product. In this example, the one, four product is the thermodynamic product. Um, let's look at reaction coordinate, coordinate diagrams to kind of show this. It's on the next page. Over. 
actually gave you this same diagram in the thermodynamic kinetic handout. We actually looked at it already. But this is referring to the reaction we're doing. Just shown condensed here. The alkene attacks, by the way, does it matter which alkene attacks in this case? Doesn't matter which alkene you attack. If I attack over here, what do we get? If you attack the other alkene, you get the same thing. It just means you turn the red. Okay? This is a symmetrical dye. It doesn't matter which alkene you react. And by the way, we're only reacting with one equivalent. Okay, you can write this in. Obviously, if you look at the product, there's only one equivalent. You could come back again and react again because you still have an alkene left. And alkenes react with H3R, right? So you could actually do two. I'm just doing one equivalent. Okay, but in my example, it is a, it is a symmetrical aldehyde. You have a transition state for your protonation to you get the common intermediate, which is what? What is the common intermediate? What can we call it? Allylic permocation, right? We've got it drawn up here two different ways. We have fake resonance structures, or we can show it as a hybrid. From there, that's when the reaction varies. We can either get the 1, 4 product or the 1, 2, which is more stable. In this case, the 1, 4. It may not be in other cases, but in this case, the 1, 4. Lower down, right? More stable. Now, at one point we said that something that's more uh, stable is going to have a lower transition state leading to it. Does this have the lower transition state leading to it? No, it actually has a higher transition state, which is sort of atypical. The transition state leading to the 1, 2 product is actually lower. Why? Why is the transition state leading to the 1, 2 product lower? Right, we've already answered that. Right here. Which is going to be easier? There's a transition state. This attacking here. Or this attacking cross-country. Which one's going to be easier? Closer. That's, that's talking about the transition state energy. That's the energy it takes for the attack to occur. Right? Easier attack. Okay? Proximity effect. But guess what? That, that doesn't lead to the more stable product. It actually leads to the least stable product. We call it the 1, 2 product. To get the better product, the more stable product, you need what? You need more what? You need more energy. And where's energy going to come from? Heat. That's why, back over here, you need higher temperature to form this. If you keep the temperature cold, if it's cold, it will never have enough heat to go up there. If it's cold, it comes this way. And there you go, you get the one, two, five. So with heat, we get which product? We have to be careful. It's the one more product in this example. Give me a more broader answer. With heat, we get what? The more stable product. In this case, it is the one four. Can you determine stability between the different alkenes? Yes, we talked about that about 10 days ago. It's like about 10, 20 a.m. Um, now we said that the one two products from fast is always first. And this reaction here, what's formed first? 
Not that product. That product is formed first. This is shown below. <laughs> we could say this, or high temp. Either way, that's formed first. But from there, if you have high temperature, this can convert to that. That's what's going on. See, this is heat, right? Heat symbol. Because with heat, the bromine can come back off. They can just leave. We can just show it leaving. Come back off to form the allylic cation, and then it can go back on over here. Okay? And these two are actually in equilibrium with heat, because if from here it can come back off, this can go back and forth. This mechanism can go back and forth, that's what this is showing, and you thus have an equilibrium. And if you can achieve equilibrium, which one goes out? More stable. Once you achieve equilibrium, then it becomes thermodynamically controlled, and the most stable wins out. Well, which is most stable? Left to right. right. That one we call a thermodynamic product. And so if you can get heat, that's what, you, that's what the end product is. It doesn't mean the other one was not formed along the way. Basically over here, with heat, even with heat, <coughs> this is going to be the preferred pathway. It comes here. But with heat, it can go back. And if it goes back, if you put enough heat, then it can bump over. And if you can bump it over, then it comes here. Now it can go either way, and at that point, it comes here on me. At that point, if you can go either way, that's going to be favored. That's equilibrium. Uh, you have to see what type of questions uh, here. Let's do some examples. Non-symmetrical dienes. Question here is which alkene do we react? Gives that. Yes, there's a new H on the end. Where's the cation now? Right there. And let's assess cation uh, substitution. This is secondary. This is what? Primary. Alright, what if we attacked? What if the attack occurred over here? Attack here. Would that be that right? Windshield wiper over. <coughs> I 
cation here. What type of cations did you make over here? Tertiary and primary. Which is better? This is one, this is one cation. The hybrid has characteristics of secondary and primary. This hybrid has characteristics of tertiary and primary. This is better. Okay? That is not going to occur. Okay. Now, where's the attack of the chloride going to take place at? Which product will we form? Product is which one? Product is that right there. Cold temperature. Which product do we get with cold temperature? Yes. Which product? I mean in general. Kinetic, which product is that? Just like the one four is not always the most stable. It could be that the one two is. Good. I think the answer is cold always gives proximity effect is what takes place. It takes more heat to go cross country and tack away over there. The one two. Did we circle the a one two product? Thus, thus where, where, where's the cation? Where's the chloride going to attack? Here's the H. Where was the chloride when the, when the H got attacked? Near the H. And so now this just comes here because it's easier. If it was over here, it had to come across country to attack. That requires more heat. But this is faster. There's your product. It is a, it's a 1 2 product. That is a 1 2 product. There's another 1 2 product up there. Which, which of the others is a 1 2 product? also a 1-2 product, but that came from, from like this. These are 1-4 products, if you look at them. So you need to be able to identify if it's a 1-2 addition or a 1-4 addition. Do it with a different example. 
right? Uh, there you go. So what type of questions come up? Uh, next is Jill's Alder reaction. Let's take a little two minute break first. And, uh, Okay, guys, let's look at Dill's Alder reaction. Uh, Dill's Alder reaction is uh, perhaps one of our first named reactions. Uh, we saw a name before, Lenlar. Lenlar's catalyst. Lenlar was a chemist who developed the uh, poison catalyst. Have we seen any other chemist name? Well, we've seen Fisher projections and Newman uh, confirmations. Those are chemists. Markovnikov, Russian chemist, okay. But in terms of a reaction, Markovnikov is a general outcome. Along the way, you'll see specific reactions that have proper names, chemist names. Uh, Dills Alder reaction. Actually, two chemists, Dills and Alder. Uh, and this reaction won Nobel Prize in uh, 1950. Um, this Dill's 
solder involves reacting a diene, it's a diene reaction, with an alkene, with a diene and an ene. And these react to make a ring. So it's an annulation reaction. Yeah? And we'll do mechanism here. But importantly, you need to recognize that this is four carbons, and this is two. And all these end up being in the ring here. And we make a what size ring? Well, four plus two equals what? Six. Six. Very good. OK? A Dills and Alder is sometimes called a 4 plus 2 cycloaddition reaction. And 4 plus 2 is 6. You make a six-membered ring. And a six-membered ring will always have one pi bond in it. And so what do we call a six-membered ring like this with one pi bond? A cyclohexene. If all six of your deals all uh, reactants. If the diene is all carbon and the ene is all carbon, for us it will be, well, mostly, but you can have better around them sometimes. Six carbons, it's going to be cyclohexene. Uh, and every deals all will have a cyclohexene somewhere in the ring, in the product. Okay? There may be lots of decorations on it. It may actually be two or three rings all together. But you will find that cyclohexene in a deals all product. Um, mechanism here. Well, it's sort of just kind of p-orbital overlap. Uh, there's not a lot of polarity here. Um, in terms of error movement, we can do that first. What if we show these just kind of windshield wipering out and going over here? Right? Just doing this. Well, these have to leave. What if we show these windshield wipering out and going and making a bond over here? Well, these electrons have to leave that carbon. Well, they can move down and replace what went out here. So we just move these down. And what is, all, what is that arrow movement get? Those three arrows right there. Those three arrows give product. And these three arrows happen all at the same time all concerted. It's like there's just one transition state. Now we can also do an orbital view of this. The diene has two pi bonds, right? One electron, one electron, one electron. And we show it localized. We know there's overlap here as well, right? Resonance. Is that the diene? And then here is your ene. And you can kind of draw this. Well, I'll just draw it like this. But there's your double bond there. What's going on here? These two are reacting. But it's basically if the transition state is p orbital overlap. <coughs> these two p orbitals here come close together and they start over interacting. And these two p orbitals come close together, and they start interacting. Of course, these always were. And this is sort of your transition state. And if you ever see it in the transition state drone, these, these, you're making this ring. And these electrons are repositioning, and they're reacting. Okay? But, it involves pure orbital overlap, but what happens is this becomes a sigma bond between here. We make what bonds? That single bond there, sigma, that. What is being made in the Diels Alder? What, what type of bonds? Is, is Diels Alder exothermic or endothermic? What type of bonds are being made? Two sigmas. What type of bonds are being broken? Two pi because the original has three pi's combined. 
but the product only has one. We're going, we're going from essentially two pi's are converted to two sigmas. Does that sound like it's going to be exothermic or endothermic? Exothermic, yeah. You can get your calculator out. Favor by thermodynamically, yeah. What about what about entropy? What about entropy? Is this reaction favored by entropy? No, no, no. no. Why not? Two molecules going to one. Yeah. Okay. Is this an ionic mechanism? How many intermediates in this mechanism? Zero. It's just a transition state. Right? No intermediate. Uh, Dills and Alder discovered, discovered this reaction, though. Uh, this is the diene. This thing over here apparently likes dienes. It's reacting with it. What do you call something that likes dienes? Dienophile. So you got a diene and a dienophile. And the dienophile is typically an alkene. Can it be something else? Yes, it can be an alkyne. By the way, this says heat. That's kind of common. Does it make sense that you would heat this reaction after we talked about entropy? Entropy's not favored. If, if it's not favored by entropy, would you want to heat it? No. Why not? Because why? It's going in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but why? Because heat's a product of that, because it's exothermic, so it's really No, no. But you're talking thermodynamics. My question was looking at entropy. Uh, entropy. No, not enthalpy. Entropy. See, see, I'm talking about entropy, not, not, not enthalpy. Um, you're just not answering your question. You're kind of just restating the question. Yes, there's, there's, you have two to start with. You end up with one. Why would you want to heat this or not? Why not? To me, is the answer is if you look at the Gibbs free energy equation, entropy is magnified by temperature because it's T delta S, right? Okay. If you have a bad term, do you want to magnify the bad term? No. Heating will magnify. It's T delta S, right? If you magnify the bad term, you're going to make the reaction bad, meaning it ain't going to want to happen, right? Uh, so why am I showing heat? That's because you've got to be careful about heat. Heat. Uh, the reaction may not even take place without heat. But high heat is bad. But my first statement told you it had to have heat. It could be a case where 100 degrees is enough is the heat needed to do it. But you wouldn't heat, want to heat it like 200 or 300. Because if you keep going even higher, then it gets worse. What I'm telling you is some heat is required to do this because you do have to get over a transition state. You just want to keep the heat as low as possible. But it still may require some heat. That is, you don't just want to cook it up on 500 degrees and think that's great. No, you've gone too high. See what I'm saying? 
a little bit of heat is necessary. So you, this is something that may look odd to if you understand how heat is and entropy go together. And how, okay. So again, it may be that 100 degrees is good, but 200 becomes bad, and actually, yes, the reaction will reverse with too much heat. But that's an entropy. Um, and the reason it would burst would be because of entropy, not because of enthalpy. Uh, because this is a more stable situation. Uh, stronger bonds. Okay, can we do it with other things with, other than alkene? You can also do alkyne. We can zip it together the same way. This here movement gives what? Yes, ignore this double bond here. Do you see the cyclohexene we said you would get? In this case, we have something else. We also have a double bond over here. Why? Well, if you see your mechanism, one pi bond moves out, what's remaining here? One remains here. We didn't move both out. Okay? So you should see that your arrow movement gives this. Four plus two is six, but there's a double bond over there as well. You've got to let your mechanism error move be your guide to see what you're forming. Well, hopefully nobody wants to just memorize it. If we do this, then we have to just memorize that. No. Everybody understand error movement? Error movement is helping to see what's going on. Now your error movement can be either way. I did it sort of starting here. In this case, it's sort of flipped and they're starting it here and here. here. Either way works. All this is happening in there once. It's a single transition state from this product. Uh, I took this from the uh, from the thing internet. Y'all heard of that? Um, there we go. There we go. A cycloaddition. This is called a cycloaddition because these two are adding together. But you're also making a ring, a cyclic. So it's called a cycloaddition. A more broader term is a pericyclic reaction. A pericyclic reaction is any reaction that has a cyclic transition state. Here's your cyclic transition state. There's about three types of pericyclic reactions. Cycloaddition is one. The other two we're not looking at. But I think the Klein book has a chapter dedicated to pericyclic reactions. Okay? Cycloaddition is the most common. When Gilles Alder is the most common cycloaddition that you will see at the introductory level. Uh, let's focus in on the two reactants, the dienes. Uh, this is sort of symmetrical. This is not. You may have to consider the regiochemistry. The diene can be in a ring itself. Back over here, the S cis form is required. Because this diene, when you draw the mechanism, don't both carbons have to be pointed over there to the others? These four have to be pointed towards the two. Okay? If, it, if the diene is like this, it can't react over here and make a six-membered ring. This is pointed the wrong way. This has free rotation. That's a single bond. But somebody could actually argue against that if you want to try to make an argument. But I'm saying it has free rotation. And so we can rotate one double bond over. This is called S cis. The S refers to single bond. It's like the double bonds are on the same side of the, if you consider the single bond to be point of reference. For this, if you consider the single bond here, the double bonds are sort of opposite of that reference, but as trans. Now that's just rotation. So those are ultimately just rotors. Is anybody questioning whether this can rotate or not? Can a single bond rotate? Yes. yes. Is this really a full, just a single bond? Is there a P orbital overlap here? Yes. Yeah. Overlap, overlap. Is there overlap here? 
Yeah, that's resonance. Should the overlap restrict the rotation? If adjacent p orbitals are overlapping, should that restrict rotation? Yes, it should. So how is it able to rotate? That's why I'm telling you, you can make an argument. Uh, that's a, that's a, it's kind of a gray area there. Maybe it's not enough overlap to restrict the rotation, and with a little heat it can still kind of rotate. Okay? It's a gray area. I was just wondering if anybody was thinking that when I talked about that this could rotate. Yeah? Pure will overlap should restrict rotation. Okay, we'll see these, we'll see rings. Uh, there. The dienophile. Your dienophile, like the alkene, all right, alkene, you can circle them, they typically have electron withdrawing groups attached to it. Like a carbonyl or a cyano group or a carbonyl or in this case two carbonyls. These are all electron withdrawing groups. They're going to have electronegative header atom. Common electron withdrawing groups. The diene can also be in a ring. This is in a ring and with electron withdrawing groups. S2, of course, alkynes are linear. Okay. Um, We'll talk about why the importance of this electron withdrawing group. Uh, let's first look at stereoselectivity. We'll look at some details of this reaction. Diene, dienophile, 4 plus 2, we can zip this together. Yeah? There's our cyclohexene. But these two groups are going to be on those two carbons. you got to recognize which carbons you're dealing with, right? I'll do this one time. That's one, two, three, four, five, and six. What carbons are bonding down here? Four and five. What carbons are bonding here? When this swings out, six becomes bonded to one. Okay. And the two ester groups are on 5 and 6. But the key thing here is these two carbons are now tetrahedral. Will these two groups be cis or trans? They're going to be cis. Why? Because they're cis over there. Uh, this reaction is said to be stereospecific. The mechanism is stereospecific. Basically because there's no intermediate, it's just a transition state. These things are cis, it reacts. They never had time to change. They started cis and then they, they're cis at the end. Right? We could look at this sort of closer, but that should be kind of enough. They started cis, it remains cis. Uh, on the other hand, this, we could do the trans version of this alkene. And when we zip this together, you don't have to do this every time, zip it together, you're going to be trans. Half of this is just understanding that your product can be cis or trans, and that two different reactants get two different outcomes here. Stereoisomers. Um, let's look at the dying. This board is getting better and better. I don't know. When we first started, it was terrible. You know? For some reason, it's getting. Maybe it's just. No. That's the easiest to tell, anyway. Uh, let's look down here. 
This diene has two groups. We zip this together. Uh, four plus two is six, right? We'll have double bond there. We'll have double bond over here as well, right? Because we had an alkyne. But look at the two carbons here where the two groups were. They're now tetrahedral. And the two groups can be either forward or back. What will they be? They will be cis. Why? The answer is because the diene had the same configuration. They're both E. Now this is where you might need some more explanation. But we're not going to do that. If you take advanced organic, you might look at this Diels Alder stereochemistry more clearly, closer, maybe even model it and see how that. So for us, we're just going to have to make this statement. If both of these are the same here, they're going to be the same here. If you get out models, you can see this. Again, it's because the reaction, it starts a certain way and zzz, it just is one transition state, it's there. Sort of maintains the stereochemistry. It's not as easy to see how you go from this to this here. But what if we have a diene that looks like this, where that double bond is E, but this one's Z? If you do this, you will get these two groups now trans because it had opposite configuration here. Okay? So that's some stair chemistry there. Again, I took that sheet from the uh, from the internet. That's that's not mine. This is mine. Back to mine though. You can provide both work for the following reactions. Okay, I'll let you do those on your own. So you can Think and see, okay. Only when you start thinking do you then realize what you might need to think about. What do I know? Uh oh, what do I not know? Right? Try those on your own. Uh, down below. Maybe I'll do this one here. Let's do this one because it's a ring. The diene is a ring, and then the dienophile, okay? It's not really going to be any stereochemistry here, it's just how do we deal with this ring? Well, you just zip it together and just ignore that. Um, what's the difference between that, which would be the diene, what does this have that this doesn't have? How many? You said another, one other. Does everybody agree that we just have a CH2 connecting the, that's just a CH2 there, connecting the diene, mm -hmm. okay? Well, zip it together as if that was not there, and just add it back at the end. Let's just ignore it. It zips together like this, right? And we make a what? Four plus two is? Six and what do we have? What carbons do you want to call this? One, two, three, and four. One, two, three, and four. Yes. Five and six. What is on one of the other carbons over there? The cyano group. I'm going to put it up here. And what else do we need to put here to finish this up? The one that had more the CH2. CH2. Yeah, but CH2. there's something before the CH2. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Carson, what's missing here? Yes, yeah, right here, right? Mm -hmm. Come from this area here, and this, this comes down to make the pipe one. Because all deals alters that has a cyclohexene somewhere in the property. There's your cyclohexene, but what else is here? Well, then add back that, that thing that made this a ring. The bridge, the bridge between one and four. In fact, it's a what? It's a CH2 bridge between one and four. 
Everybody agree? But it's still there. We can draw that like that. And that's often how that will be shown. There's another way to draw that there. That right there is very common and that's sufficient. You see I'm just adding back in that CH2 bridge. That's how you do those. You see the original ring? See the original five-member ring right here? That five-member ring just sort of did a dissolver to add that other ring there. And all that other, you can see the now the cyclohexene back there, but the two-carbon bridge is still there. That five-member ring is still there. It's actually two rings in the product. Now. Okay. You can try these. Uh, there's some others. These all have rings. Try these. This reaction here, uh, the product is then converted ultimately to the antiviral drug Tamiflu. And I think that's on one of the handouts, or maybe the next one coming. Is it pink? No, it might be the one after the pink. Okay, please try those. You've got dyeing reactions there. Uh, down below, uh, down below, we talked about going reversing, yeah? Reaction can reverse. It is very common. If you take a Diels-Alder product and heat it, particularly very high temperature, it can reverse and go back to the diene and the dienophile. That's called a retro Diels-Alder reaction. Reversing retro. Okay. And you should be able to go back. Air movement here. I would start with the pi bond. But really, you want to move pi electrons. It's almost like we're doing, remember the transition state, how we lined up the p orbitals? It's really, it's really p orbital stuff. But because it's two different molecules, it's not resonance, it's a reaction. Start with the pi bond. And flip it up, or move it towards another carbon. If we flip this up, well, something has to leave that carbon. That the signal bond has to break. And this is where you're not doing resonance, because if you're doing resonance, you would never break the signal bond, right? The signal bond flips down and becomes pi bond there. Well, something has to leave here. Well, this signal bond breaks, and these electrons move over to replace what left there. Start with the pi bond and just move it and break signal bonds. And what does that get up? Don't look at the products. When that moves up, we got double bond up there, yeah? But that broke, and those electrons moved down here, but this broke, and those electrons moved over here, right? If you look at that, well, that's what I drew over on the side. That's what happened. And going there, that is driven by what? Enthalpy or entropy? Entropy. Entropy, one molecule going to two. That's where the molecule is breaking apart, and that's called a decomposition reaction. This particular decomposition reaction is called a retro dissolver. Okay. Now, in the, uh, tomorrow and Thursday in lab, we are doing a dissolver. But one of the reactants has to first undergo a retro Dilsalder, and that's how we're actually going to generate the diene. And then the diene will react with something else there. But it's also got a sulfur and stuff, and so it's not all just hydrocarbon like we're doing here. Uh, this can also be called a thermolysis reaction because we're heating it. I mean, if you just heat something and then it chemistry takes place, you what does lysis mean? 
splitting, splitting cleaving. So with heat, we're, we're cleaving the compound, right? Isn't that what we're doing? With heat, we're lighting, we're cleaving something. So that term should make sense. But it is a relative result as well. Okay, so think about it. You need to be able to think about going backwards as well. Uh, that steals alder and dienes. You need to spend some time on that. Um, oh, there's the Tamiflu. There's the key back there. Um, look. Don't look at it until you try. There's a synthesis of Tamiflu. Compound one. Lots of reactions. But the very first reaction is a Dill's alder. Now they're adding a catalyst here. We don't need to talk about that. They're heating it at 50, okay, a little heat. 50 is a little heat. You wouldn't want to heat it at 500, that's too hot. 72 hours. 72 hours, okay. A little bit long, we're not going to be doing this in the lab. Unless you set it up on Monday and then <laughs> Thursday, okay. Uh, product and stereochemistry, they're getting endo endoexo, we haven't talked about that, and that's diastereomers. Uh, there's some stereochemistry in there you can look at, but we're not really covering that. Um, uh, something missing here, did I take it out? What happened here? I'll have to say, oh there it is, back there. Okay, that page. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think of yeah. Uh, We need to look at regiochemistry. Stereochemistry is actually easier here. What about regiochemistry? If you react this diene with this ene, 4 plus 2 is 6, which 6 member ring are you going to get? Which regio isomer, which uh, would you get? Will these groups be in a 1 3 relationship or 1 2? Why do you do this? Well, this option comes from this is not a symmetrical diene. When it zips together, if it zipped together like this, we would get which one? That gives which one? The first one. But guess what? This molecule could be flipped. And if we flipped it the other way, and had the OME up here, the methoxy group up there, and it zipped together like this, we would get which one? The second one. The second one. So how do these come together? Let's look at that. We need to look at the polarization that is here. This is the easier one. Remember I said we're drawing groups? Okay? The withdrawing group polarizes this, and we can do resonance. Well, we can move the pi electrons up. We've done this before. structure there. And by the way, resonance is seen several places along the way. Covered resonance. We saw resonance in 1, 2, 1, 4 additions. By the way, we did point out terminology back over there. Did it say direct addition? 1, 2 is called a direct addition. What is 1,4 called? Look back over there real quick. 1,4 is called a conjugate addition. Because with 1,4, you have to really invoke the idea of resonance to get the other cation. Well, resonance is conjugation. So 
but really invoking that you have con con it's called conjugate addition. One, two is called a direct addition. We've been doing direct additions for 10 days now, two weeks. The one, four is called conjugate addition. Um, what we're really going to find out here is carbon. One of these carbons is going to be partial plus. We'll see that. We've got to figure out which one, and then over here identify which one of these is going to be partial minus. And once we can identify the partial plus and partial minus, we'll make sure they end up bonded together. Can you draw another resonance structure here? Windshield wiper these up. partial plus, top or bottom? Bottom. You see that from this fake structure right here. Bottom is partial plus. We see that from residence. That's, that's always easy. This is an alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl compound. Everybody agree that that's a carbonyl compound? Well, the first carbon is called alpha, and the next one's called beta. Do you agree that the alpha beta, there's unsaturation there between the alpha beta? Alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl compound. And these, the beta carbon is always the partial positive, as explained by drawing resonance structures and seeing that right there. And that's the purpose of the withdrawing groups. We show them back over here. Partial positive. Now the nitrile can act the same as a carbonyl. You can do resonance, partial positive. Here it's symmetrical, so it doesn't matter. They're both. The rest of them, they're all symmetrical. Here, though, the beta carbon, partial positive. Resonance. Now we have to look over here and say, which carbon of the ones that end up connected over here is partial minus? Well, we need to do resonance structures over here. Where do you want to start with resonance structures over here? You remember I said, with neutrals like this, start with what? Long pair. And move the long pair. These can be moved in here, move these out. I think I'll keep this here until we see which, which one, which way we need to go. That gives what? No. That's not right, is it? Or is that wrong? How many long pairs now on the oxygen? One. one, because the other long pair moved in to make pi bond, right? Now positive charge. What's here? Long pair. Almost <coughs> gotta be a charge. That's net neutral. This should be net neutral. Minus here. Alright. Can we keep going with that long pair? Let me move it here and move these out. structures of, yeah, and that's it, you can't do any more, you have to come back the other way. So, which carbon of these that we're going to end up bonded over there, which one of these has minus character? Mm -hmm. Top or bottom? 
Well, you see it right here, topless. Does the bottom carbon ever take on minus? No. The top one is partial minus. And over here, which one's partial plus? Bottom one. Well, there you go. Make sure that those two are bonded in your product. Because when these approach, the partial negative end of this molecule is going to want to be a close. Okay, physics brings these together. What's the product then? Well, I need to determine it, right? Isn't that partial minus and partial plus? These two need to bond together. This is the way it comes together, and the product is which one? Yes. If you do this reaction, you're going to get that regioisomer. So you have to know how you have to do resonance to see your polarization. And by the way, resonance will always be something you have. Okay. You go along and be like, you need to do resonance. Okay. Resonance becomes a fundamental tenet of organic chemistry. To more fully understand structure and thus reactivity. Yeah? Uh, you can do the next ones on your own. Try those. Okay? Good amount of homework in this particular one here that I want you to be doing, and then we can see what type of questions. All right? Real quick at the back, uh, these are some prostaglandins. I think there was a prostaglandin on the test. Yeah. It was an analog, it wasn't it? something that didn't change. Uh, prostaglandins here in your body, you may look at this in biochemistry or something. Uh, prostaglandins uh, mediate inflammation and maybe pain. Okay. They cause inflammation, they cause pain. Well, these can be good responses, but you don't want too much pain. How can we stop pain, stop these from being formed? Aspirin inhibits this enzyme here, the Cox enzyme, and blocks these from being formed. Okay? Other drugs inhibit this as well. What is this enzyme doing? Look at this. This molecule in your body is reacting with oxygen. Another way to stop this from happening is just stop breathing. What's going on here though? Oxygen can be drawn like this. How can we get here? Well, these electrons move here, and these electrons move here, but then these move up here to make a single bond. This becomes like a CH2 bridge, it's still there. This would be just a single transition state. Now it's not a Diels Alder, because a Diels Alder involves a diene and an ene. This can be considered an ene, although it's oxygen. But that's that is a diene, but it's not a conjugated diene. Diels Alder, the diene is conjugated. It's not exactly a Diels Alder, but it is a pericyclic reaction. It actually also is a cycloaddition. But you get this, it's called an endoperoxide. This is catalyzed by an enzyme. Uh, from there, it keeps going, and ultimately this OO bond gets broken, and that's how you end up with uh, two oxygens here. And that, that used to be the CH2 bridge. But then that one got oxidized. So the, the two oxygen built originally came from O2. Um, so that's kind of a, a, a application of a cycloaddition reaction to something very biochemical. And ultimately, ultimately makes you cross the planets. Um, okay.
Uh, this one here uh, causes platelet aggregation. And you know how aspirin is said to be a blood thinner? Well, because it can inhibit this, keep this from forming, and so you have less platelet aggregation. So aspirin still so doesn't blood. Okay? If it keeps, if it blocks something over here, you can less of this form. Um, this is amazing biochemistry. You know, so organic chemistry mixed in with biology. And, you know? uh, okay, you can do some work on that. Last questions on that hand up? Uh, we can look at substitution a bit. Any other questions? How are we doing? Lab? The uh, deals also we're doing in lab. With he. I don't see a dying. I don't see a dying. You're told it's a Diels Alder. So this molecule undergoes a retro Diels Alder on heating to generate butadiene. You can do error movement here. Driven by entropy, one molecule breaking apart into two. Okay. Sort of like the retro deals over. But then this is what reacts with this. Because these two actually don't react with each other. This first has to become, and this will react with them. Uh, the SO2 is a gas, it will come out the smokestack. I don't want to be breathing like you could put it very ventilated because SO2 is a arrhenius uh, acid. You know what an arrhenius acid is, right? Well, SO2 is not a bronze to an <coughs> acid because it doesn't have an H. What's an arrhenius acid? Thank you all. Good. Gin. A one with an A one with an So it's methane as well, which is. Um, I mean, I can show you a number of compounds without an H that are not. Are also, what's arrhenius acid? Okay. Well, it, it is an Arrhenius acid. Uh, so that's the reaction we're doing there. Uh, okay. Well, with this handout, we're moving into a pretty big topic. Uh, substitution reactions. Okay. In Gen Chem, maybe they're called replacement reactions. But a little bit different. But it's analogous to a replacement reaction. Kind of. Closest thing you may have seen. Substitution. Uh, replacing one group with another. All right, we did plenty of addition reactions. That's where we're just adding something. Nothing is replaced. Here we're going to replace or we're going to substitute. For example, this reaction here, we're replacing the OH with a bromine. It's more than just addition because the oxygen is gone. It's a substitution reaction. We will have steric chemistry. Um, all right. Substitutions. Now the, the main title here is Nucleophilic Substitution in the Tetrahedron of Carbon, Chapter 7. General line reaction. Uh, we're going to have a uh, leaving group on a tetrahedral carbon. X is leaving group. I call it LG. This is replaced by a nucleophile. Nucleophile typically is going to have a lone pair. A nucleophile is going to be high electron density. It likes a nucleus. A nucleus is positively charged. Something that likes a positive charge, something that's negative. 
It doesn't have to be formal negative, it can just be high electron density. The nucleophile replaces the leaving group. The X is the leaving group, right? Uh, the X takes a lone pair with it. We'll see that in the mechanism. Your best leaving groups typically are halogens. Iodine is the best. Oh, this is the most stable, most willing to leave. Fluorine is the worst. Uh, and there's a cutoff there. F is really a terrible leaving group. But there will be other types of leaving groups. A specific example, we've got this alkyl bromide and we have hydroxide. Now we can have exact charges. The hydroxide replaces or substitutes off the bromine and now the OH group is bonded to the curve. <coughs> okay. Let's look at possible mechanisms for this, for this model reaction. Mechanism meaning moving the electrons, proposing intermediates, etc. The first thing I'm going to do is call it SN1. Uh, what do we need to do here? Does everybody agree we need to break this carbon bromine bond? It's been broken. And we need to make a bond between here and here. All right. Well, leaving groups will learn to just leave. All right. The better ones can do it easier. Uh, in other cases, we may have to do something to make it be able to leave. Um, what if I just have this leave? That is, this, the electrons move on to the bromine. What does that give? What does that give? Hmm? What do we now have on this carbon? be a positive charge, because how many H's are on that carbon? Two. It's a positive charge. What did we create? Just a BR. How many lone pairs? Four. Because what does this arrow mean? The bond moved on to the bromine is a fourth lone pair. Charge of the BR? Negative. Minus. Is that possible? As we go along, we'll say yes. But is it possible in this case? Because it may not always be possible. We have to make an assessment. By the way, what general term can you call this? This neutral molecule became two ions. Can I call it ionization? Does that work? More specifically, can I say ionization of the leaving group? Did the leaving group sort of ionize off? This is terminology we will use. What is this? Tell me what this is. Yes, it's a carbocation. What type of carbocation? Primary carbocation. Okay, what do you think about that? Is that good? Could be easily formed? No, primary carbocation is just pretty bad. All right. What's your best type? Tertiary. Tertiary. I can tell you a better type. Tertiary resonance would be better than just plain tertiary. Everybody agree? Okay, we can judge carbocation stability. All right, but let's continue with this. What, what would have to, have to happen next to get a final product? Hey, look, we already formed that product. These electrons make bond here. What would that give? There you go. All that air movement would give that. By the way, there's got to be a plus on the board. Maybe we use sodium hydroxide. And now the sodium sits with the bromide, and we can show sodium bromide. And the sodium was a spectator ion, right? I just omitted the spectator ion. Uh, is that the mechanism? Uh, let's do a reaction according to the diagram for that. Let's assume it was. Uh, we got some type of reaction progress. 
type of energy here. Let's put the alkyl bromide some arbitrary level. We call that A. We can call this organic intermediate B. Final C. Where do you want to put C compared to A? Sigma bond, new sigma bond. Can we tell a difference? It's harder to tell. If you went from sigma to pi, that's easier. It's harder to tell. We could have to get out our calculator. It's not, it's not that important right here. I'm just going to put it about, about the same. Where do you want to put B at here compared to these two? Here. It's an ion. Okay. There's two elementary steps here. Formation of the carbocation and then nucleophile attacking the carbocation. What are nucleophiles like? Nucleus. That's See, if they were called positive files, it'd be clear. But it's not called a positive file. It's called a nucleophile. But the nucleus is positive. Nucleophiles like positives. You see how that's like in the positive? Okay, we bond it to it. It's called a nucleophile. Okay, there's a transition state leading to carbocation, discrete intermediate. Then there's a transition state leading to C. How big of a transition state energy? Not too much. We're going downhill. It doesn't take much energy to fall downhill. Which is the rate determining step? There's your activation energy for that step. This is your rate determining step. Formation of carbocation. Typically your rate determining step in that mechanism. This step would be called what? Fast, yeah. Nucleophilic addition, let's call that nucleophilic addition. Fast. Ionization followed by nucleophilic addition. If you get that, let me ask you this. Of the two substrates, of the two reactants, how many are involved in the rate determining step? Is the alkyl halide involved in the rate determining step? Obviously, it means the bond is being broken up there. Yeah. Is the hydroxide involved in the rate determining step? No. Hydroxide is ne not here. It comes in later. Only one thing involved in the rate determining step. This mechanism that I showed is called a substitution by a nucleophile. That's what that means. But it's unimolecular. One molecule involved in the rate determining step. And this is more briefly, or they call it an SN1. I just showed you an SN1 mechanism. Here's the question. Is that the mechanism for this model reaction? Or should we consider another mechanism? Here's the answer. Primary carbocations are very bad. You typically never want to propose them in a mechanism. You will see them in mass spec which you're watching that video, right? But this is bad. Why is it bad? You see how I drew these for bad in this case? I should have drawn that up there at the ceiling. But that has very high energy. And then imagine how difficult it is, okay? Uh, let's finish up by showing that it's, uh, another mechanism. I can, what's another way we could do this? Well, how about this? What if we take these electrons and come in here and kick the bromine off at the same time? What does that error movement give? <coughs> there you go. That gives that, right? Hydroxide bonding to the carbon, BR got kicked off. There you go. Any intermediate? No intermediate.
previous mechanism had two steps, two elementary steps, forming chromokine and the nucleophilic addition. How many steps does this have? Okay, one. How many intermediates? Which question do I want to ask? Steps. How many steps here? How many steps in this mechanism? One. Okay, what would reaction 40 diagram look like? Um, I'm just going to call this B, because if we called it C, you would be like, well, where's B? There's just two. There, there, is, there is nothing else. It's just A and B. you got to label your axes, right? What does this look like? It's just a transition state. There's no intermediate. An intermediate is going to be an intermediate, intermediate well, right? Okay. Which is the rate determining step? That step. There's only one step. It must be the rate determining step. Everybody agree? There's only one step. That step is the rate determining step. How many of the substrates are involved in the rate determining step? That is these two. Both of them are involved in that one and only rate determining step. So we're going to call this a substitution nucleophilic bimolecular, SN2. The one and two refers to the rate determining step. How many of the substrates are involved? Uh, okay, we're, we're out of time here. Does this look familiar? Have we ever attacked a carbon and kicked something off? Stereochemically, how would you do this? Backside. Over here, we attack a carbocation. Which side would you attack carbocations from? Either side. Either side. See, we've already covered stereochemistry. We don't even have to do that. All the stereochemical chemical discussion we've already covered. We'll just keep doing that again. I gave you a sheet how how to attack carbon. Keep that sheet handy. Okay, guys, we'll be moving ahead with this handout here.